Good morning, everyone. And uh, it's a big topic to get, get across uh, to, to try and understand the opportunity of cloud. And I think one of the challenges and the reason we founded the Cloud Industry Forum as an industry body back in 2009 is that with any new market that forms, you always have this different uh, perspective that comes about from a, a vendor perspective. There's a lot of marketing, a lot of hype, uh, and enabling, therefore, the end user community to be able to determine like-for-like -like comparisons uh, in a world of cloud services it has been quite a challenge. So we set about building the self-certification because what we felt was essential was two things. One is that in an, in an industry like ours where there are a lot of new entrants coming in to deliver services, it's important that there are best practices adopted and that people understand when people talk about service levels or data sovereignty and those kinds of aspects or um, you know, how they will back up a 4.9s or 5.9 service level uh, definition, it's important that you can compare apples with apples. So one side of it, uh, as was explained, is all about the um, best practice and the, the self-certification. But the other aspect of it has got to be helping ensure that that knowledge around best practice is transferred into uh, and understanding in the marketplace. Because the one thing that we can say uh, in all sincerity about the world of cloud is it's much more about business models than it is about technology. Uh, and the challenge is that there is no universal cloud, so it means different things to different people, a bit like the uh, parable of the blind man and the elephant. So just to kick off this session uh, and to, to sort of level set, because I think it's very important that we all work from a, a common understanding of the market, it's understanding why this thing has still got to be taken very seriously. And I think putting cloud computing to one side, the underlying drives, and certainly some of the commentary you heard from the real world experience of David in a, in a county as close to London as Essex, is driven by the realities of the landscape we live in as a bunch of people. And, and these phrases have become fairly popular uh, in, our, in our modern language. And the notion of consumerization, the fact that at any point in time, uh, I am a human being and I have friends and family and I want to communicate with them. Uh, the fact that I have a job and I need to collaborate and create and the fact that I am a citizen and therefore I expect my rights and I need to be, want to access the internet and I expect my data to be protected. All of those things occur at one and the same time. And so when, what we've seen with um, devices and all this that coming into the market um, is that culturally inside the UK we've sort of built silos that probably don't exist in many other countries, as we'll come on to. The second notion, of course, is that of contextualization. And I think we really are seeing massive step forwards in this area at the moment in time. And what this is basically saying is it doesn't matter where I am, what I'm doing, what time of day it is, we are seeing a level of convergence of capability and experience that means that I can access things in a common uh, look and feel through a common set of devices, typically summarized as free screens in the cloud, the mobile phone, the workstation, the TV. All of these are becoming internet enabled. All of them are able to deliver uh, cloud-based services as we move forward, and all of them will be able to present a common UI. So our experience as human beings as well, and certainly when uh, you know, enterprises and public sector organizations don't, don't necessarily have the uh, infrastructure behind them, what we end up with is this situation where as citizens or as, as a, uh, consumers, we get oftentimes a richer experience than we do uh, in our workplace. But that is starting to converge. And it comes to this third point of proliferation. And it's quite a humbling fact because one of the stats I like quoting uh, is about the UK. We rank 14th on a global ranking. And that global ranking is about smartphone adoption, uh, mobile phone smartphone adoption. Uh, and we sit between Vietnam and Bangladesh uh, in terms of uh, our mobile phone adoption rates. Um, but what's interesting is when you look under the covers of that, because it tells you a couple of other stories. The first thing is, ranked 14th, we have 122% mobile phone adoptions to people. Okay? So if we take the young kids, I suppose in this day and age, it's only up to about five before they get a mobile phone, uh, or our grandparents who've never taken on the technology. If you look at the, the core population, you're typically getting you know, every one and a half adults has two devices. And that's a cultural thing about our nation, that we have built up this governance which says, that's your device for work, that's my device for home, and obviously... Good old Steve Jobs came along and changed our whole culture about what we prefer to have as a personal device versus something with a flashing red light. Um, you know, it, it sort of created this, uh, this notion from a, a limitation of how technology was in the past as opposed to what the opportunity of technology is in the future. You contrast that with the Bangladeshis and the Vietnams where one device will suffice. They don't have that same sense of 
governance and control that have built uh, up uh, the uh, business world that we live in today. But ironically, and it's a bit like the transition from cable, um, sorry, copper to mobile phones in the third world as well, is that certain parts of the world are leapfrogging in technology just because of the time in which they're adopting it. But what you find is that you have populations around the world now accessing technology. And obviously, the one thing you can say about cloud is it does have no barriers. And so the amount of innovation, even just here in the UK, just around the greater London area of companies that are building penny apps, so apps that can be delivered to any consumer theoretically, is a, is a huge growth market. But putting that to one side, what it's really talking about is that from anywhere in the world these days, you can pretty much do anything. And if you put the notions of consumerization and contextualization together and look at it as a, how's it going to impact the way we deliver public service? How's it going to impact the way we manage a large workforce? How is it going to enable us to give a better 24-7 experience in, our, uh, in the markets and, and the uh, environments that we serve? Uh, it's, it's an interesting backdrop because I think we haven't even really talked about what we do with this technology yet, but actually understanding the power of it and the pressure on us to respond to that. But it's, not, it's pressure because it's coming from the ground up from uh, ourselves as consumers, but it's also opportunity, as Dave was saying, understanding that maybe from a legacy infrastructure point of view, you don't have the breadth and capability you would want, but knowing actually you've got a, an increasingly educated market used to these kinds of technology devices and able to work in this kind of compartmentalized view, which says, so long as I can secure my data and my application, then why shouldn't I use a common device? It's starting to change the whole balance of opportunity. So anyway, we're not really here to talk about that, but that's just to set the scene. If we look at cloud adoption in the UK, and I've contrasted it to the US, so we as the Cloud Industry Forum, we conduct research regularly, and this is our most recent uh, research, which is looking at uh, 300, sorry, 400 organizations, ranging from SMBs all the way out to enterprise, private sector, public sector, uh, and compared that, comparing the UK to the US market. And there's some interesting trends that come out here. The first thing is, is that from a formal perspective, in terms of organizations that have adopted at least one cloud service, so it was a conscious decision by IT, so not an individual with a credit card trying to do a CRM for a sales team or something like that, or you know, uh, some kind of you know, uh, functional manager operating in their own environment. This is talking about when organizations have consciously made a decision to either adopt a new service as a cloud service or indeed migrate something. So just over 50%, and what's interesting with that 50%, which has uh, changed over the last year, is that a year ago, that 53 was 48%, so it has grown in real terms by 10%, 48 to 53, 5, 5 on 48, 10% growth. But what you saw a year ago was a lot of discrepancy between large organizations and public sector and small organizations. And what you saw is very small organizations, so sub-20 seats, and public sector, regardless of size, adoption rates were about 38% a year ago. Whereas uh, in the private sector, mid-market, and enterprise, uh, adoption rates were uh, around just under the 50% mark. What we've seen happen over the last year is that public sector adoption rates have grown to 52%. Uh, and the private sector enterprise have moved up to 54. So they've both grown, but the rate of growth in public sector has outstripped that uh, of private sectors. So it's still behind, but, it, but it's rapidly grown within that period of time. <clears throat> the other interesting thing is satisfaction levels. Those stats are quite hard to believe when you look at you know, a 96 and a 98% satisfaction level. But I think this comes down to, as well, how people have adopted cloud. Because typically speaking, uh, cloud has been adopted in that first instance in what I would characterize as an opportunistic way. So people have either had technical constraints, resource constraints, skills constraints, capital constraints, something that they needed to get done and a time to market, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, and they basically were looking to prove the opportunity for doing it in a way in which they could not manage through their traditional forms. And because of what they were able to achieve, satisfaction levels are very high. A year ago, that was 94%. We were worried when we ran that survey, it was too high, but it's been consistently up there. And I think if you have the right expectation of what it is you are trying to do, the likelihood is you are going to see that level of satisfaction. Now, the world is not all perfect, and I'll explain some of the negatives in a minute, but it is interesting to see how people approach it. The first reason people typically implement a cloud service is, is down to the flexibility of what they're trying to achieve, more than about cost savings. Cost savings will follow, and they will typically be the thing that drives second wave of adoption, and that's why you get to see that in this year, of those people that have already invested in a cloud service, is almost three quarters of them in the UK. 
are looking to invest further because of what they've seen they've been able to achieve uh, off the back of their uh, uh, investment so far. Um, so uh, new users are going to grow by almost 20% in the year and, and cloud, well, I think the most important issue is, and it sort of comes back to what David was saying as well, cloud is now formally seen as part of the IT strategy. It is an option for how IT is delivered. Uh, and therefore, when new projects and new opportunities come back, uh, come, come up for review whilst the, if you like, the enterprise strategy is being worked out, people are looking at that deployment option uh, as to what's viable for them. As I've already said, there isn't a universal cloud, and I think this is part of the challenge for us uh, as a marketplace in terms of both vendors delivering to the market and end users in being able to navigate the wood for the trees is that we can get blindsided and confused by the service delivery models, um, the as-a-service models, the deployment models, public-private hybrid, the routes to market from you know, implementing a private cloud yourself to going for a brokerage to the underlying technology used. There is a lot of noise out there. And I think the important thing to understand is to say there is no universal cloud. What you've got to look at is what's going to influence your decision at any given point in time. Putting the strategy to one side, when you're looking at individual uh, applications moving to the cloud, typically you're going to look at these kinds of issues. Obviously, the nature of the solution, uh, and in terms of the things like the sensitivity of data has already been mentioned, and the, the whole issues of data sovereignty and regulation that might go with that, um, the uniqueness of that process, and that maybe some legacy uh, restrictions that you have in terms of the architecture of that, uh, the levels of integration that needs to happen between something that you've already implemented and something you're going to move potentially to a cloud service that scalability, that predictability. I haven't got time today to go through that list in any great detail, but the point I'm trying to make is you can quite simply assess a range of issues that you will face as an organization to determine what kind of options you have for cloud service delivery. And what you'll tend to see is that there's a, a general trend between obviously ge generic and uh, bespoke capability and whether or not you're needing or wanting to deliver this in-house or, or outsourced and as a service. And there are a range of both technical deployment options, there are a range of commercial deployment options that are open to everyone. My challenge is that you will probably find most of you will have various forms of those at any given point in time. It's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. <laughs> it's going to be a range of options alongside your on-premise capability. And what you'll tend to see is that the things that logically stick on premise are those that have that kind of legacy architecture about them or have you know, heavy restriction or fear of restriction around data. So the one thing I would actually um, push back on with, I totally agree with David in terms of working within the EEA in terms of the data protection laws and all the rest of it, but one interesting stat that came out of this research is 73% of UK organizations do not want their data outside the UK. It doesn't matter the fact that it is actually uh, operating under the same legal jurisdiction. That is part of the, you know, we're an island state, we have an interesting relationship with Europe at the best of times, but if you go under the covers of that and just look at what people's comfort level is, and certainly it becomes more relevant in public sector and the very small businesses, proximity to not just the data and knowing exactly where it is, but the route to that data in terms of trusted partners and relationships is absolutely critical. So certain things will stay on-prem. But arguably, you can easily move to a private cloud, whether you implement that yourself or whether you work with a, um, a vendor that you know where their data centers are and where they can locate it and where third-party integration to your legacy apps is key, a private cloud is going to be a very logical option. If your primary issue is cutting cost and getting basic tools out to your workforce, then naturally public cloud in terms of time to market, cost efficiency, if you can live with the generic capability and you don't need the integration to other applications, there are viable routes to market for that as well. And certainly unified comms is one of those marketplaces uh, where we've seen great take up from a, um, a public cloud perspective. But I fundamentally believe, and yes, there is a definition of hybrid cloud if you look at NIST and all those kinds of things, but when I'm talking about hybrid, I'm really talking about the fact that most organizations for the foreseeable future are going to have a blend of on-premise, online, in-house, outsourced IT. Uh, and understanding the challenge for that uh, and how I manage that is really going to be my primary role uh, as a CTO, CIO going forward in the marketplace. You're not going to be able to see the details on this slide. What I would say is everything I presented from a data point of view is available from our website as free downloadable white papers. But what you can hopefully see is there's a grid there and there's a, some, some value in every box on that grid. And what the grid is showing is by types of application area, what kind of models of deployment did the uh, customer choose from on-premise to SaaS to private cloud, etc. And what it basically shows you uh, is all of them are viable. 
effectively. What's viable for you is going to be re related back to that sort of quick uh, ready reckon I gave you earlier. So the message I want to leave you with is diversity uh, is going to be increasingly common. That is the fact of reality that we have got to manage. How do I decide what is the right deployment model to give me the right returns and the right outcome for any specific application is one thing. Understanding how I manage that from an interoperability point of view, from a data security point of view, and from a um, perspective of governance of my IT stack is really the thing. So thinking about the tools you have for monitoring your end-to-end -end IT estate and understanding the, how you manage supplies is going to be a key aspect uh, for any IT organization going forward. And just quickly to rattle off some of the things that we will see happen in 2012. I think we'll see new organizations adopting cloud services for the first time grow by 20%. We'll see three quarters of organizations that already have a cloud service in place are going to increase that use based upon the positive experience that they have had so far. We're going to see further evidence, even though we're talking here to an audience of enterprise and, and large public sector, what we are see in reality is organizational size is no longer a determinant of uh, access to technology. It always has been. Whenever we've seen any major shift in technology, it's always been the large enterprises that have got there first because they've had the resources. This technology is a genuine leveler. We're seeing that proven here in the UK market today. Public sector, though, will continue to grow at a faster pace than private sector as it runs to catch up. Uh, and we will certainly see that evidenced by work going on the broader G Cloud initiative and some of the government targets that are being put in to push spending into a cloud delivery model by 2015. Uh, if you look at organizations who have the most prolific use of cloud, you will tend to see they have email storage, web services, collaboration kind of technology as core. But not that they are the only things by any shape or form, as you saw from that previous slide, even though you couldn't read the detail. What we're basically saying, though, is where they have multiple services, they will tend to aggregate around those activities. But we're equally seeing a heck of a lot of growth in remote desktop, converged telephony, and unified communications. They tend to be, if you like, the, the strongest growing new kids uh, on the block. Number one concern for everyone is still data, data security, data privacy, data sovereignty, and data portability. Um, they are the key issues that anyone has got to be able to address when they're looking at their deployment models. IT strategy will continue to embed cloud as a delivery option alongside on-premise. It will just become part of the normal cycle of how do I deploy the specific solution. And therefore, governance activity of distributed IT will become arguably one of the basic competences uh, in managing large-scale IT uh, going forward in the marketplace. Private and public cloud will both continue to grow at a pace, but they will serve fundamentally different issues. Typically speaking, you will not address the same issue in either a private or a public cloud. I would see they being very sector specific. Uh, but mobile and cloud convergence, where I started this conversation, uh, is gonna be continuing to drive us for innovation uh, and opportunity in the marketplace. And organizations will look for independent standards to help navigate this uh, issue. So if you go to cloudindustryforum.org, you can see the organizations that are signed up to the standard. And what I would say is the organizations that will most likely succeed are the ones that provide that implementation and management service to help you, you know, differentiate, help you overcome those choice issues, those migration issues, those management issues as you move forward. With that, sorry to rattle through it very quickly. It's a lot to do in 15 minutes. That's, that's the presentation. If you go to cloudindustryforum.org, you can download the white papers about that content. Thank you.